Hi hey everyone, my name is Fanny Smith. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Para-Athletics Development Manager at Athletics Canada. This is Introduction to Para-Athletics for Officials, Part 2. Um, this follows the Part 1 session, and um, we do recommend watching them in order. Um, but if you're watching this one first, you can go back and watch Introduction to Para-Athletics for Officials, Part 1. Um, so I am a little bit new to para-athletics or a new to Athletics Canada. However, I bring um, 10 years of experience in uh, different roles working with para-athletes. Um, so I've been volunteering on board, role, board roles, um, worked as a mission staff at major games and um, in administrative roles like this one. Before moving along, I want to again acknowledge, um, as I did in the first session, that I, I live on the beautiful territories of the traditional um, territories of the Tawasin First Nations people. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have um, this beach in my backyard. This picture was taken out of sunrise. It's absolutely wonderful to live here. So in uh, part two of this session, we're not talking so much about uh, the technical aspect of para-athletics. Um, so we're moving away from rules and um, the sport itself um, to really talk a little bit more about the social and human interaction elements of working with athletes with a disability. So we're going to talk about disability language and interactions and some of what we cover may actually be new or uncomfortable to you. And so, um, you know, take some time and and uh, sit with that. And if you have some burning questions that I'm not going, um, that I don't answer through the webinar, uh, please reach out at fanny.smith at athletics.ca and I'll be happy to, um, to answer any further questions that you might have. Another good uh, resource is looking through our Becoming Pair Ready document, which is um, on athletics.ca under Get Involved Parathletics. You'll find a link to this document. A lot of what we're covering tonight, um, or not tonight, but in this session, um, is from that document. So, you know, rereading it and absorbing it in different ways um, might be helpful. So, um, you know, I think it's important to understand disability um, in uh, the broader aspect of it, and that helps us, um, you know, understand parathletics a little bit more. So as you can see here, one in five Canadians uh, over the age of 15 identify as having a disability. Um, however, the number of people with a disability who are part of a national sport organization, such as Athletics Canada, is actually less than 1%. So we are not reaching um, a big percentage of athletes with a disability and getting them involved in sport. So in part one, we touched a little bit on the term disability versus impairment. So I just want to kind of revisit that. So disability in the context of the Paralympic Games and the Paralympic system, uh, movement um, is uh, the International Paralympic Committee. So the IPC uses the term impairment when it comes to classification of para-athletes into sport. Um, but, you know, disability is probably more of a day-to-day -day term um, that we use in, in more kind of plain language. Um, so disability implies the social component and it's a general umbrella. So a person might have a disability that may or may not be caused by an impairment. Um, an impairment refers to more of the medical condition that affects one's function to um, do certain activities or how they interact with the world around them, um, including their function to run, jump, throw, or wheel in the context of Parathletics, and so that is why, under the um, IPC, we work with the term impairments um, as defined by the World Health Organization. So, understanding disability really also means taking a moment to understand um, ableism and disabilism. So, um, I will read this description here. Uh, ableism is the discrimination of uh, against people with disability based on the belief that um, some typical abilities are superior. It's really roots in itself in assumptions um, that people with disabilities require fixing um, and that their disability, um, they're defined by their disability. 
um, you know, it's just like racism, sexism, um, this is really kind of takes this less than approach and includes a lot of stereotypes and misconception and generalizations about people with disabilities. Um, I'm including this graph here. This is um, actually from Becoming Para-Ready. So um, I'm not, I'm not going to go into like great detail, but um, basically it helps illustrate that um, the individual, the athlete with a disability or the individual with disability is at the center of everything that um, surrounds them. So uh, research in a disability sport context has really shown that there's actually several layers of social, cultural, organizational, economic, community, interpersonal, and intrapersonal factors that we all need to consider to be able to deliver and support um, activities and programs for um, para-athletics and para-athletes in, in Canada. Um, and so this, um, this is illustrated in the Becoming Para-Ready with a little bit more information. Um, and really, you know, building a more para-ready community in Canada really requires all of us. So at the national sport organization level, at the branch level, as individuals in our individual roles, so whether we're a coach, an official, a parent, um, to really look at everything that surrounds the individual um, to work at breaking down barriers for their participation and for meaningful competition. Um, again, the term people or persons with a disability really refers to a group or a population, right? It's a general umbrella term. So uh, with that in mind, we have to remember that it's not a monolith, right? This is a diverse group within um, that definition of, of people with disability. Uh, they have diverse needs and wants and two people with the same disability or impairment type may experience different barriers and have completely different needs. Um, we discussed this a little bit in the first session. Some disabilities are invisible or harder to see. So communicating with um, each individual to really understand their needs. So maybe not necessarily in your official role, um, you would have full conversations with them. But if you, you know, are meeting people with disabilities or working with athletes with a disability in a different role, um, you know, some communication and really creating that rapport and that trust is really in important so that you can really get a better um, understanding of their unique needs um, and, you know, create uh, ways to uh, surround them and, and break down barriers for them. So um, the, the word, I just wanted to kind of cover a little bit, sorry, the definition of Paralympics. And so um, in a live session, I will run a poll and ask people um, what Paralympics stands for. Does it stand for paraplegic Olympics, para-Olympics, or parallel to the Olympics? Those are three, um, well, two of those are mis, uh, misconceptions of what it actually means. Um, so the word Paralympics actually means parallel to the Olympics. So people do often think that it's Paralympics. Um, it's often written that way in, in, in uh, written correspondence when people um, are confused that. Um, and, or they also uh, think that it stands for paraplegic Olympics. And, and that's actually something that I thought when I first started kind of getting involved and in being introduced to what the Paralympics are. Um, now, para-athlete versus a Paralympian. Um, so a para-athlete refers to uh, an athlete participating in para-sport. So you may also heard me refer to them as athletes with disability. Para-athlete, they're kind of interchangeable in a, in a way. Um, however, you're only a Paralympian if you have participated and competed at Paralympic Games. And that's exactly the same as an Olympian, right? You're, you're not Olympian unless you've been to the Olympics. Um, the Paralympics are also um, often confused with the Special Olympics um, and really simply kind of put Special Olympics actually refers to an organization and a sports system in itself and not a single event where the Paralympics are a single event that happens every four years, just like the Olympics. Um, the Special Olympics are also solely for athletes with intellectual disabilities, whereas the Paralympics um, Parasport to have a wide range of um, disabilities or athlete or impairment types that can participate. Um, we covered that in part one, so I'm not going to go into it uh, much further. 
Um, and there is sometimes a crossover of intellectual impairments that may participate in, in Special Olympics and also um, uh, be eligible for the Paralympic Games. That is a, um, a little bit of a complex uh, piece. And so I won't uh, go into that um, here, but there, there is some information available for those that want to know a little bit more about that. Um, the other thing that's important to note at the Paralympic Games is that performance standards are actually um, really important. So athletes that are striving to compete at the Paralympic Games have to have a high level of performance, a high level of athleticism, dedication, motivation that's really, you know, uh, equal to those of athletes trying to qualify for the Olympic Games. And I give you this example kind of uh, to illustrate that. So this is the finish line at the um, 100 meter T64 race in Tokyo. And so um, again, a reminder that T stands for track and 64 is for a lower limb deficiency. Um, so Phyllis Strang from Germany uh, won gold in this 100 meter race with at 1076 seconds. Um, the silver medalist came in at 1078. And so we know that running um, a 10, me uh, sorry, a hundred meter race under 10 seconds at the Olympic games is, is you know, what, what the standard we're at. So they're, you know, they're, they're coming in fairly close. Um, you will also see a record for the hundred meters in the T12. So T track 12 being that visual impaired, vision impaired athlete in the middle um, that may compete with or without a guide. That world record sits at 10. So we're going to switch a little bit um, into language. And so um, words matter. And what I mean by that is that in any way that you communicate, it's important to have intention um, and be really kind of uh, purposeful in the words that you use. And words are such an important part of inclusion and um, in all, you know, diversity and inclusion areas, including disability. So using derogatory, sorry, terms, uh, outdated terms, ableist, ableist language um, can really kind of like help um, enforce uh, disrespectful stereotypes. Um, so you can see here in this picture uh, graphic here, a little cartoon strip, it says, so what do you prefer to be called? Handicapped, disabled, or physically challenged? Um, lady says to the man in a wheelchair, uh, whose response Joe would be fine. So, um, you know, I think that obviously we have heard a lot of these um, kind of words like uh, handicapped is definitely outdated. Disabled is one of those words that um, has a lot of conversation around it. So some athletes will uh, refer to themselves as disabled or you in the definition earlier, it did say um, disabled. And so that is really boils down to an individual preference. Um, physically challenged is definitely not one of the words you wanna use um, or special needs or just, you know, some of the made up words like diversability or handicapable or, um, you know, a few varieties of those. Um, you know, disability is really not a bad word. So you can use it. It uh, describes exactly what it needs to describe. Um, and uh, there's no, you know, you don't need to, to be afraid to uh, use that word. Now, um, again, that individual, going back to the individual preference, um, certain athletes may refer to themselves a certain way um, versus other athletes. And uh, I think it's just really important to respect individual preferences, but also to do it in a way where you have established rapport and respect with the person that you're engaging with um, before changing your language. So I definitely um, suggest starting with a person first language versus an identity first language. So person first would be um, using athletes with a disability or person with a disability or person with a vision impairment. Um, whereas someone might identify um, as identity first. So they're like, no, I'm disabled and that's what I lead with. So I am a disabled athlete. I have, am an autistic person. Um, I am a blind athlete. And so again, those are individual preferences, um, you know, and it's always ever evolving. But right now my um, suggestion is to start with that person first 
language. So putting the person before this descriptor um, of disability after it. Um, another little um, kind of thing to be aware of is um, we, you know, you've you, we talked about Olympics versus the Paralympics, which is an easy kind of uh, comparison. But if you are comparing people without disabilities to people with disabilities or uh, sport for people without disabilities to uh, disability sports, um, avoid using uh, normal or uh, mainstream for the sports that um, are for people without disabilities. So we want to avoid that um, uh, uh, comparison where we put the um, para sports or the sports for people with disability at a lower kind of level than, um, you know, the Olympic kind of stream. So I um, might say that uh, Olympic stream versus the Paralympic stream. Able bodied sport is still um, used in the context of the um, you know, sport world in Canada and um, in you know, day to day language for, for us that work in para sport. Um, I, that's probably one of those things that eventually will change, but because it kind of implies that uh, para athletes aren't of able bodied, but they're very capable and they're very able to participate, um, but you probably will still hear that. Um, and, you know, don't be embarrassed if you happen to use an expression, um, something like see you later to someone that has a vision impairment or you, know, you got to be running along or, hey, do you want to walk over there to someone that um, might be in a wheelchair um, or any other thing that seems to make a reference to a disability. Um, you know, we all make, make mistakes. I'm sure there's probably even something on this webinar that, you know, in a few months will have changed and um, it's, it's ever evolving. Everyone's learning. Um, you don't know what you don't know. The best way if you do get corrected or you, um, is to just be like, oh, I didn't even realize I said that. Um, perfect example is again, I've said, you know, I, I've, I've been working with para athletes and para sport for 10 years. I have a lot of friends with disabilities. And, um, not long ago I said, uh, I'm working on this project for people in wheelchairs. And my friend says, people who use wheelchairs. And I was like, oh yeah. So they're not in wheelchairs all the time. Some other people may not catch on that or may, it does, may not even bother them. It's one of those kind of like subtleties where words matter. And to that friend, um, that did make a difference. I said, oh yeah, sorry about that. I'll, you know, that's a good point or something. And then you move along. There's no, you don't need to be embarrassed or, you know, over apologize or, or um, you know, just accept that you're learning and to, to do better next time. So that kind of brings us to interactions, um, right? If you have not been around people with disabilities that much, um, you know, might be uncomfortable at first, you may not be sure how to, to interact, um, how to refer to them. So, um, you know, I have a picture here of Amanda uh, Rumry. So she's, you know, what a Canadian athlete. Um, so if I was to say to my friend, John, hey, John, can you see Amanda over there? Oh, no, who's Amanda? I don't know Amanda. She's a girl. Um, she has like braids in her hair. She's wearing black earrings. And she has like, she has like one of the Canada jerseys. And it actually says Rummery on her, on her shirt. Can, you know, can you go tell her that I'm looking for her? So not once do I actually refer to Amanda, uh, to Amanda's disability because it's not really relevant. I just want to talk to her. And I don't need to point that out as the obvious. Um, whereas maybe if you're a coach, you need to accommodate for an athlete and you're having a conversation, say, oh, we need a ramp um, to, you know, at, at this venue. And someone says, well, why do you need a ramp? Um, you know, it's so, 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 and so coming. It's like, well, you know, um, Barry has, is in, uh, you know, uses a wheelchair. See how I almost said in a wheelchair there. So it's just kind of getting used to, um, to, to, to the new terms, but it's, uh, it's important in that um, context that we know that Barry uh, uses a wheelchair and he will need a ramp to access the venue. Um, another thing that, you know, could, could seem obvious, but it, it happens. And again, it's just kind of like uh, something that we're not always sure is that people with limited hand use or with, um, you know, amputations or that have artificial limbs, 
um, you can still shake hands with them. Um, so in the case where if you extend your right hand and there is no right hand um, on the athlete, you can um, observe that first and extend your left hand or, um, you know, not be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Just kind of like change to the left or, um, you know, a uh, elbow tap or, um, you know, a different kind of like acknowledgement um, is fine as well. Uh, people with limited hand use, um, uh, spinal cord injuries where their hand function to actually shake hands is more limited. Um, a fist bump often is, um, is a good way to, to do that kind of introduction. Um, again, uh, if you're meeting someone with a vision impairment, um, introducing yourself uh, and saying, hi, I'm Fanny, nice to meet you. Or if you're meeting them again saying, hey, um, Joe, it's Fanny. Um, remember we met in such and such context, how's it going? I'm here with, um, and make sure that you're introducing any other people that are with you. Um, and if you're part of a conversation and you're trying to get their attention, make sure to say their name so that they know that you're talking to them and, you know, know that they're, you can't rely on body language or, or, you know, eye contact. Um, uh, mobility equipment. So wheelchairs, walkers, canes, crutches, um, you know, uh, artificial limbs, um, they're part of a person's space. They're basically an extension of their body um, and they should be uh, respected as such. So don't touch um, the day chair that's sitting on the side. Don't sit on it. Don't put something on it. Um, it may seem obvious, but it happens. Um, and the same would go for um, any sort of like equipment on the field of play. Um, some athletes um, may have speed imped impediments or take longer to um, get a thought out. And so make sure that you're patient and you wait for a person to finish rather than trying to correct them or to finish their sentence. Um, and if you don't actually understand them and you don't hear what they have to say, don't pretend that you do. And uh, you can ask to repeat and maybe like ask um, direct questions that will just require yes, no, or nod. Um, it's also great to, uh, a great um, kind of uh, frame, <laughs> frame of mind to not make assumptions, right? So you don't want to make assumptions that they can't speak um, or, or any other kind of element around what their disability um, and their impairment might affect. Um, we also want to make sure that we're addressing the athlete directly and not the parent or the guide or someone else that might be there working with them. Um, now, uh, assistance. So sometimes it's a natural human response to want to help someone that might be struggling to um, pick something up when they're trying or um, get up a steep kind of like incline or, um, or anything of the likes. Um, so don't actually like go to someone's assistance unless they ask for it. Or um, you can say, hey, let me know if you need any help with that. If you know you see that they've been trying a few times, um, but you know if they say no, I'm good. Don't be like, are you sure? You look like you need some help. Um, so just kind of respect that it's their choice and that um, you know they have independence. And if you're not around, they're likely trying to figure it out on their own. Um, of course, unless they're in a very dangerous situation, um, then you know kind of act as you would with with anyone else. Um, Yeah, that's, I think, kind of uh, covers interactions. Of course, there's so many different nuances. Um, if, you, if you find that you do one of these things, which I think we all have, and I certainly have, um, you know, don't be embarrassed and, you know, don't over apologize or, or make a big deal out of it. Just apologize if, if an apology is necessary, kind of like um, clock it in for next time and, uh, and move along. And so this, um, this session is really for officials. And so just a, a few quick kind of considerations as, as officials. So, um, you know, use the athlete and the coach experience as far as like, if you, you can't remember a rule or you're not really sure what that person needs, you can ask them directly. Like they will be, they're the one with the lived experience um, and they are the one that can best advocate for any modifications or needs or, um, 
changes that they require to be able to um, participate fully. It's also important to remember, um, like we, we touched on in that first session, is that the rule modifications that are done in the World Parathletics um, rule book, they actually exist to support the athletes that compete um, so that they compete on a level playing field. And they actually take into consideration their functional impairments. And that's how the rule modifications um, come into play. Um, mutual respect, we've talked about respect a few times. So again, just kind of like treating the athletes with respect the same way you would any other athlete that is showing up at your track meet um, and, and, you know, expect the same in return. So if, um, if an athlete is giving you a hard time based on a rule, but you know that the rule is true, but they're trying to maybe put you in an uncomfortable space by saying, well, I don't have any eye cavities, so why do I need to put some eye cover? I can't see anything anyways. Um, but the rule clearly states that they must wear eye covers. Um, you as an official, you're there to enforce the rules and there's ways obviously to do that in a respectful manner. Um, so expect return, give it, back, uh, sorry, is expect respect and give it back in return. Um, and of course, you know, we, we, we talked about this a little bit. Um, some of these meets are very important to athletes. So they're not just coming out to, you know, it's good to see them uh, coming out to have fun. You know, they may be there to actually get a ranking. And so even if they're the only person there and it seems like it's a lower level meet to you, um, don't make assumptions. It, it could mean a lot to that athlete. And so they need to have the environment set up so that they can succeed and have um, the rules be enforced so that the, the, um, the result counts. Um, now, in, in other sessions that will be um, available, uh, you will learn specifically about um, event specific rules and what to do in certain cases. This is an overview, it does not cover this. So if you are an official that is specialized in a specific event, I do encourage you to try and find that information um, and to review those specific rules. Um, and then, Having said that, uh, also before any track meet to kind of like go over the, um, you know, emergency protocols and um, accident protocols with uh, your head official. So uh, put a, a little picture here of um, a wheelchair accident that happened at a race. This happens quite often. The wheelchair racers will crash into each other. Um, and again, that human you know, response of being like, oh my goodness, like someone go help them. Um, it's not your job to run onto the track. It's quite dangerous to do so. Um, so there will be some uh, protocols in place that will, um, you know, will kind of decide, dictate what should happen in this case. Um, the same thing if for, if you're putting together a start list, um, there are some considerations uh, around having wheelchair racers um, on the same start line as ambulatory athletes or amputees. So, um, you know, seek some advice if you find yourself into that situation. So that really is um, the end of, of this short and sweet session on kind of like disability awareness, language and interaction. Uh, again, quick overview. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach me at fanny.smith at athletics.ca uh, and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, once again, that becoming para ready resource that is on para, um, in the para athletics section of our website at athletics.ca under get involved is a great resource to learn more about this. Um, and if you're new to the Paralympic kind of movement or the Paralympic um, para athletics and Paralympics, um, look up Rising Phoenix on Netflix. And that is a great movie to uh, kind of give you, uh, it's a great documentary around the, the Paralympics and gives you a good sense of some really high level athletes. Um, and then if you're interested in, in learning more about um, the disability advocacy um, and the Disability Act, um, how it came out about in the US, um, Crip Camp on Netflix is also a great documentary that um, covers some of that, um, that, that, that advocacy. So I um, hope you enjoyed it. And again, if you have any questions, fanny.smith.smith at athletics.ca. Thank you.